Let's give the praise band another hand. Um, due to, uh, well, me, they, this was a, a, Jeremy stepped up and did amazing stuff and put together a, a praise band team last minute. And so I want to thank you again. That was fantastic. Um, and if you are participating in 40s Friday, will you stand up? Stand up, 40s Friday people. Y'all are awesome. Y'all look fantastic. Uh, quick note, uh, while it's on my mind, because I'll forget if I don't say it now, if you are dressed up, uh, if you will stay after chapel today, they want to get a picture of all of you. Um, so if you'll stay after, that'd be great. Um, other than that, so I can stop taking all this time, we have a real treat today. Uh, pastor Chris Williams is going gonna, is gonna to come and join us. Uh, he is the pastor at Fellowship Greenwood. Many of you probably know him. So we're excited to have you here. My pleasure. Uh, are you okay with it right there? Is that, is That's that fine. Okay? You leave okay. it right there. All right. Awesome. awesome. Hey, man. Thank you, John. I appreciate that guy. How about you guys? Yeah. Give him a round of applause. He is a good man. Appreciate him. Uh, man, I just love coming to Calvary. Uh, and I'm glad to know it's 40s Friday because... I thought, well, I missed out on something. Where's my zoot suit? You know, I wasn't sure what was going on. Uh, but anyhow, so glad to be here. I don't know if some of you guys know or not. I'm a two-time ga- graduate of this place, and uh, I have a great fondness for getting back on campus and, and just love being here. I know some of you guys are visiting your high school students, kind of checking things out. This is a place to be, so just staying, you know. So uh, glad you guys are here. But John gave me uh, a list of topics to talk about, and so I thought I'd talk about all of them. So I hope we have time. No, uh Well, the one I wanted to talk about is, well, it's the problem of humanity that we all deal with. It's that problem of, well, that discontentment. Isn't it hard just to be content in where we're at and what God has for us and what we have at the moment? I mean, discontentment is one of those things, it can just sneak up on you out of nowhere uh, like like a ninja, doesn't it? I mean, just think, you know, you're at the mall, you get you a new shirt. You know, you, I look goodness. I mean, you know, for us guys, like the sleeves, just the right tightness. You know, it's like a smedium, right? It looks like you got the right size arms, you know. Uh, it's just the right size shirt. You know, I look good in this. You're feeling good. And then you walk out and you see someone who really wears it well. And all of a sudden, what you felt about yourself, that discontentment just creeped in and overtook you. Maybe uh, you've been working hard. You finally saved up the money. You got, a, you got an upgrade to your car. And you're like, man, this thing, this is looking good. And then you look over and, well, the guy at the light, he has, well, one that's just a bit shinier, a bit faster. Um, happens often. I drive a, uh, a Honda Accord off-road edition, and uh, every once in a while I pull up to uh, one of these big pickups, and, well, my discontentment creeps in. My, my Honda Accord doesn't seem like it's an off-roader anymore, right? But discontentment is one of those things. It just creeps in on you. It just kind of shows up. And here's the thing. If we're going to live the life that Jesus redeemed us, uh, to live, if, if we're going to, to live the life that, that he has, came to, uh, has come to give us, then, well, we, we've got to learn that, well, uh, possessions and stuff are not the foundational elements of life. They're just not. Uh, they can be nice add-ons. They can make life easier, but, well, get our true meaning. It's not where we find our purpose. It's, well, not where we're going to find our, our, commit, our contentment. So uh, one thing we need to do first off is I think a lot of times we use the same dictionary, but a, well, our same vocabulary, but a different dictionary. So let's define some terms. What, what does it mean to be, uh, well, content? First off, contentment is not laziness, okay? It's not laziness. It's not selfishness. It's not complacency. I mean, the, the Bible denounces those qualities, right? The Bible says it's not good to be lazy and selfish. So that's not com- could be in, uh, uh, you know, uh, content. It isn't happiness with mediocrity. Like, I, I'm just happy with, you know, uh, mediocre things. That's not what it means. You see, our God's an excellent God, and, and whatever we do, we should do, well, for his glory with excellence as best we can. So what does it mean to be content? Here's the definition. Content, the way the Bible uses it, is it gives the idea of sufficiency that something is enough. It is an inner God-given sufficiency which does not depend on material circumstances. So what we have, including our financial status, our material possessions, uh, our physical appearance, it's enough. 
It's enough for the day. Uh, and, and then guess what happens? We're free from the toil of our circumstances. We're not uh, tossed to and fro depending on how the day's going or how people are treating us or, or what we have. We can be content. Uh, well, uh, Paul's use of the word in 1 Timothy and some of his other letters gives us the idea that it's this inner God-given sufficiency, that real biblical contentment is something that God gives us. It's something that, that he gives us, and it doesn't depend on stuff. It doesn't depend on status. John the Baptist, uh, he used the same word when he urged his listeners to uh, with their wages in Luke 3.14. Remember, Jesus implied the importance of contentment when he warned, hey, be on your guard against every form of greed. And then in Luke 12.14, the writer of the Hebrews, he contrasted greed with contentment. Do you recall that? Here's what he says. He says, let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently can say, the Lord is my help helper, I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? So, so contentment really has to do with recognizing the sufficiency of what we have, especially what we have in Jesus. Amen? It's, that, that is what contentment is really about. And let me tell you, that sets us up to live in a great manner. It sets us up to live in a way that is freedom. How many of you like to be free from uh, these things that hang over our heads that we're always striving for something else? We're always looking for more. So let me give you some benefits of contentment. Uh, you know, let me tell you, all through the New Testament, obedience to God's word brings reward, doesn't it? And so if we can obey God in this area and learn this godly, uh, spirit-fueled contentment, it's going to bring some benefits to our life. So let's talk about some of those. One, uh, contentment allows current enjoyment over constant striving. Have you ever been that way? You can't enjoy today because you're striving for what could be down the road. Maybe that's you today. You're a student, and you really can't enjoy being a student. You really can't enjoy your classes. You really can't enjoy the relationships. Because all you can think about is that one day when you graduate and life starts. Let me tell you, life has begun already, and you're living it today. Don't miss out on today because you're always striving for tomorrow. So contentment allows current enjoyment over constant striving. You know, it's, uh, it's those someday aisles. You ever, you ever have those? Someday I'll graduate and then, well, uh, I'll start enjoying life. Someday uh, I'll, I'll, get a, I'll get a better paycheck and I'll get to do this. Or someday I'll, I'll buy a car or a better car. Or someday I'll get married. And we're always discontent when we live in a someday aisle life. When you're always looking for what you might do one day, you'll never enjoy today. Secondly, contentment gives freedom to recognize and be genuinely happy for another person's successes. You know what happens? When we live in a, a, a spirit-fueled contentment, we can really rejoice with our brothers and sisters when, they, when they're succeeding, when they're doing things well. You know, I know a lot of times when we're in class, it's, it's hard not to be a bit competitive when, well, uh, maybe someone is getting better grades than you or, or they're beating you on the field or they're, they're putting up uh, bigger points uh, in the game, whatever it may be. But, you know, being content with where you are allows you to truly uh, rejoice with your, your friend because they're doing well, they're doing okay. Contentment releases you from those unhealthy comparisons, those unhealthy competitions, so now when you got your Smedium on and you see a guy that's got some real guns, you, you're content with what you got, your little pipes, all right? You're happy. You're happy with it. You're happy. You see, that's what contentment does. It, it frees you from, from, well, this unhealthy comparison. And let me tell you, in the world we live in, our culture, that's what it forces, doesn't it? It forces all these unhealthy comparisons. That's what it does. Secondly, Contentment, or thirdly, contentment assists in developing a genuinely grateful spirit. Hey, those of us that lack contentment and when we find ourselves there like we all will at some point or another, bottom line is, well, we find our place, ourselves in a place where we're, we're just not thankful. We're just not thankful. And so we, we begin to focus on what we don't have. We begin to focus on those things that we, we wish we could have someday. And when we live in, in that realm, man, let me tell you, it sucks the joy out of life. 
It sucks the joy out of life. And let me tell you, thankless people make horrible Christians. They do not uh, uh, witness to the goodness and the grace of our Lord when you go through life sucking on a sour pickle. And so these are some of the benefits of contentment. And so Paul, he kind of one-ups this whole idea of contentment. And he says contentment has a, has a really good partner. He, he partners contentment with godliness. And really, it's no surprise that Paul addresses this whole idea of contentment with Timothy. Timothy was his young protege with, with all that this young pastor had to, to face in Ephesus, his church he was pastoring. Contentment might have seemed a bit elusive at times for, for this young man in the ministry. I mean, false teachers were assaulting Timothy's message. Uh, some of the folks were down on him just because of his age. And, well, the needs of the widows were growing faster than he could, he could meet them. And, well, it would be easy to, to get down on yourself and to... To, to allow discontentment to creep in and to overtake you and to steal your joy. when well, they can easily hamper anyone's desire to, to go and to serve. So in Paul's first letter, he shows the importance of contentment and how it, how it intertwines with another crucial uh, characteristic called godliness. So if you've got a Bible, open to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Open to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to read a few verses to you here. Starting in verse 3. And so Paul is saying, if, if it's a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. So, Father, we pray you would simply help us now by filling us with your spirit and teaching us, helping us to have this spirit-induced contentment fueled by godliness, that we might be believers who live a life that, well, highlights the majestic name of Christ in our words, in our thoughts, and in our actions. In your name we pray, amen. So in 1 Timothy here, Paul is describing uh, these false teachers who, who, with them and some other bad elements, have, have, well, infiltrated the church. And, well, they're thinking, hey, we can kind of have this false piety, this false religiosity, then we can make some money on that. Uh, well, this has been something that's been going on since the very early church. We, we see it going on even today in, in certain uh, strands of the church uh, across the world. I mean, there is money to be made in religion. There is uh, when you see some of these TV evangelists buying $50 million jets, apparently there's some cash to be made. Uh, now, what does Paul have to say about that? Well, Paul has a grave warning for those individuals. He warns Timothy to avoid that ungodly, wicked thinking. Paul then encourages his young friend that true godliness has, has a very real reward of its own. It's this enhanced, super-powered contentment. How many of you like to have this spirit-empowered, super-powered contentment? I tell you, that's the kind of life I want to have. And guess what? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, this is a life that you could have as well. You don't have to be a, a Christian to experience contentment. Anyone can do that. But you do have to know Jesus if you want to live in this manner Paul's speaking about. This is a, a spirit-induced, spirit-empowered contentment. And so when we speak of godliness, uh, well, Paul's meaning way more than some external piety, isn't he? It's not just something that we do, but it's, it's uh, godly. Uh, godliness is the way we, we live our life with Christ in clear focus. It's where he is our aim and our purpose. It's we have this just prevailing desire to obey him. You know, the life of the disciple really is what? To deny self, to obey the scriptures, and follow Jesus. 
That is the life of the disciple. That's what Paul is calling us to do here. So uh, what are some benefits of godliness? Real quick, again, uh, when we obey Scripture, it always brings rewards. So what are some of the rewards here? Let's look at them real quick. Uh, The benefits of godliness. Godliness increases our sensitivity towards God and with others. It increases our sensitivity to God. You know, I, even some of you, you're in a Christian school, a, a great gospel-centered, uh, scripture-laden school, but sometimes even here, it, well, it becomes hard to be sensitive to the things of God because we hold the things of God on a regular basis. We're always studying God's Word that it, beca- it can become, well, uh, less than holy to us. And so one of the benefits of godliness is that it, it, it induces this, uh, this sensitivity toward God that is, well, uh, only, only given to us by his spirit. It also makes us sensitive to, to the needs of others. That's part of being a Christian, isn't it? Bearing burdens for one another, loving one another, caring for one another. Isn't it easy to get busy with your life and you kind of have blinders on? Maybe you walk right by someone in the cafeteria or you... Uh, have class with them or you walk by them in the dorm room and you don't even know what they're going through because you've lost this sensitivity towards others. Well, godliness gives us that. Secondly, godliness increases the ability to differentiate between the things of the world and the things of the next world. Listen, this world, it's got a lot of alluring, shiny, wonderful things. And they're not all bad in and of themselves, but when they take our focus off of Christ... Well, that's when we get ourselves into trouble. You know, this is a quote. My wife is doing a Bible study on the book of Joshua, and she shared with, with me last week is the, the heart will not love what the mind does not know. And so if you really don't know the Christ of the Scriptures, you will really never be able to love him. So that's why we must be immersed in his word. And as we are immersed in his word and we really love him, then guess what happens? The things of this world seem, well, lesser important, and the things of the next seem way more important. And then we're better able to make discerning priorities and avoid the the pitfalls of immediate gratification and, and fleeting pleasures because we understand that there's a greater reward to be had. Another benefit of God in this is it fosters a willingness to live within the limits of the day. Rather than sinking into self-doubt and pessimistic uh, dissatisfaction and grumbling, godliness helps us to rest in the Lord and, and to give him our cares, and we have great encouragement and great hope with that. So, so we look to Paul's affirmation here. Godliness plus contentment brings great gain. Godliness plus contentment brings great gain. And that gain goes way beyond material wealth, which can be destroyed by a tiny little moth or oxidation. It can be stolen by thieves. But what we get here is this imperishable treasure that is so precious and wonderful. It's the treasure of heaven with our Savior forever. It gives us that inner peace and, and that satisfaction, that, that being and bring it it allows us to obey him better and to love him more and well simply to know that he is so extremely generous for uh, bestowing uh, upon us all these wonderful and amazing gifts so godly contentment that's what we're after isn't it a reverent and joyful spirit that celebrates all that god has given us now that is great gain when you can look at what you have today and you can be content. You say, well, yeah, pastor, all my stuff will fit on, on my bed. I can roll it up in a sheet and I can move uh, down the street tomorrow. Oh, but that is a grace of the Lord that he's given you. The relationships that he's given you, that's great gain. You know, this past Wednesday, I was at one of our senior adult luncheons. I looked across the room and I see this elderly gentleman in his 80s who was a worship pastor. And he's gotten to the place where his mind, well, recalls nothing. He can hardly talk, and if he does talk, he says the same thing to you over and over again, but yet he sat there and he could remember every one of those hymns. And then I look over here and I, I see this big man who 
played for the very first uh, Chiefs Super Bowl team. One of the manliest men you know who's now very small because 80% of his body is eaten up with cancer. He's just days away. And then I see uh, another man who is in his 70s whose life is failing because of kidney failure. I look at this and I think of all the things in the world that we strive for and we, 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 uh, we give our lives for, and yet life is fleeting and it, it will fade so quickly. And what are the things that really matter? That's Jesus. It's those relationships that we have. It's fellowshipping with other believers. Let's keep our eyes on the prize, and when we do that, we can be content with where we are, with what we have. So here's what I want to give you real quick. Real quick, and then we can talk. Four benefits to living according to godly contentment. Here they are. Number one, when I develop a godly contentment, material things no longer have a hold on me. When you develop godly contentment, material things will no longer imprison you. You will no longer, you know, live for these items. You'll use them as tools. You'll enjoy them. God has given us this world to enjoy, but they won't have a hold on you. Something happens to it, you lose it, your life is not lost. You know, I know people that they spend all their time and energy and monies on a certain toy. Maybe it's a car, and it gets a small little scratch. And you would have thought someone ripped off one of their fingers. It's a car. But yet, not only is their day, but their, their week and their month has been ruined because of a piece of metal with wheels. That's a beautiful car. It's a fun car. We enjoy that car. But that's not where we get our purpose and our contentment. We, we get that in Christ. We get that in Jesus. Number two, when I develop a godly contentment, I begin to live the life God created me to enjoy. Have you ever thought about this, guys? That you've relegated your life to a less than proposition because you're chasing the deception of the enemy and all the things the world has to offer. And you've never engaged in, well, the design that God created you for originally, which is to live in right relationship with him. Is that the most important part of your life? Or is all these other things? Listen, we're going to enter this world, and we're going to exit this world with nothing. Now, we need possessions. You know, we need food and water and clothing and shelter. They're essentials. There's nothing wrong with owning a car or, you know, a smartphone or some jewelry or uh, a house or even a boat or whatever. There's nothing wrong with owning stuff. You know, those things are fun. And if you've got some really cool stuff, invite me over to have fun with it, Okay. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Here's what's wrong is when those things own you. You live for those things rather than, well, uh, you live for Christ and you use those things as tools. I mean, God created this world for our enjoyment. That means vacations and uh, all those other wonderful things. But here's our broken culture. It says this. The one with the most notches on his belt, the most money in his bank account, and the most toys well, that's the one who wins in this world. And that's a lie, a lie of the enemy. Satan's a deceiver. He wants you to buy into that. Some of you going into the ministry, he wants you to buy into that. The one with the, the largest ministry or the, the one that has the most influence. Well, that's the one who's really important. No, the one who's really important is who's got the, the, the most uh, uh, foundational element of their life in right order. That is a relationship with Jesus. Amen? Hey, you know what uh, What else? Uh, Number three, when, when you develop a godly contentment, you're able to keep greed in check. The greatest enemy of contentment is envy. And it's easy to envy when you look around this world and you see things that you don't have. And before long, you forget of all the things you do have. Some of you, you may see me on my, my Apple phone and, well, you're envious because you have an Android. That's okay. That's okay. One day you can get an Apple phone, okay? One day. Just kidding for all my Android friends out there. You got to always, you know, kind of dig at you. One day you'll learn. Hey, you know, when we have a contented, generous spirit, God has us and God has our possessions. Our greed has no place to take root. It just doesn't. And then fourthly here, we're going to wrap up. When I develop a godly contentment, I can live a life filled with joy, and it's not predicated on my circumstances. 
You see, we live our lives so often that, well, our, it's all based on our circumstances. How did I do in that class? How's my relationships going? Uh, how much money do I have? What types of things do, do I have access to? And that's what brings us our joy. Well, regardless of our circumstances, we can have contentment in Christ. He said we can have contentment. So here's the thing. You say, I, I want that life, Pastor Chris. I want that. How do, how do I go about it? Just real quick, and then we can have a little discussion here. Here's how. First off, there in verse 18, if you, if you see it there, is simply just do good. Do good. Use your money and your stuff for worthwhile causes. You, use the things God has given you to be a blessing to others. Do good with it. You got a sweet, awesome car? Give somebody a ride. Give somebody a ride. Maybe deliver some meals for, uh, you know, meals on wheels or uh, uh, one good meal here locally. Use your car for a ministry tool. You need some help? Hey, man, call, uh, call the uh, school office or call a local church and say, hey, do you have some maybe senior citizens who need rides to, the, to their doctor's visits? I bet they do. And you know what? You could learn a thing or two from those wise, aged saints. Secondly, be rich in good works. It's there in verse 18. Give yourself as fully and freely as you give your material possessions. Sometimes it's easy to give our stuff. Hey, borrow this, borrow that. But giving of our time is a lot different. Give of yourself. Serve. Be irrationally generous with your time. Volunteer. Serve in the ministries of your church. Uh, uh, serve those here in your school. Make disciples. Serve one of uh, the, the great ministries that are here in our city, the ones you see on the wall here. Call them and say, hey, what can I do for you? Serve. Give of yourself. And then thirdly, be ready to share with a spirit of irrational generosity. Always be on the lookout to meet needs. And when you live a life like this, it's going to be real hard for you to always be inwardly thinking about yourself. It's going to be very hard. Bottom line is this. Here's what I want you to hear as you walk out of here. Work for the next world and its rewards, and not this world and its rewards. Let me pray for us, and then John's going to come. Father in heaven, we love you. You are awesome. You are awesome. You are great and greatly to be praised. And Father, we simply pray you would help our, our flesh... Uh, well, to see you as you are, high and lifted up. Oh, God, help us to stay focused upon you and your goodness and your grace and not to, well, listen to the lies and the deceptions of the enemy and be inwardly focused. Father, help every one of us in this room to develop this godly contentment that would bring honor to your name, glory to Jesus, and be a testimony to those who believe and those who don't. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. That was fantastic. You bet. You bet. And it sparked a lot of questions. Good. Which is good. So how do we balance contentment with striving for excellence and not settling? How much should <laughs> we strive to improve and grow? No, excellent question. Well, one, our God is a God of excellence. He, he requires us to serve as the most effective you. So I want to be the most effective Chris Williams that I can be. And so uh, that's going to look different than, uh, well, John. Uh, it's going to look different from maybe these guys. I, I listen to their podcast. Maybe uh, I, I can't be a, a Matt Chandler or a, a Francis Chan, but guess what I can be? I can be the most effective, most uh, 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 prepared me. And that's what, it, that's what it's all about. Uh, you, you, you serve with excellence in, well, the resources and the abilities God has given you, and that's the expectation. Uh, here's what happens. It's when we start striving to be someone that we just can't be is when we fall into trouble and discontentment. Well, I want to preach like Billy Graham, or I want to preach like uh, one of these well-known, polished speakers that God has given wonderful gifts to, and they're, they're a blessing to the church at large. When I try to serve like them, I'm always going to be discontent with who I am. And so I want to serve as the best Chris Williams that I can be. And when I do that, I work hard, I prepare, uh, but I'm not striving to be something that I'm not. I'm simply trying to give my life to bring glory to Christ. So if you don't meet that 
um, uh, expectation, I guess you're saying there's an expectation there. Uh, is that, and that, and that creates a discontentment in you. Mm-hmm. Is that a godly discontentment? Should I, should I be discontent in my lack of meeting an expectation? Well, here you should be if if you know, hey, I I didn't perform well in whatever it is, a relationship, ministry, uh, a class assignment, whatever that may be. I didn't perform it because I didn't put all my all my effort into it. Then you should be discontent because you didn't give it your best. You didn't you didn't do whatever that assignment was to the glory of Christ. And so, yeah, that would bring a, a godly discontentment in to to help you to strive to to live for His glory. But if you say, hey, I've given it everything that I had. There's nothing more that I can do. Well, then simply you've served him with excellence. Mm -hmm. And everyone's excellence is going to look a little differently. So I think this question is similar to the follow-up I just did. So if you you feel like that was an adequate answer, I'm going to ask it anyways. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Please speak to God stirring up discontentment to lead us to follow his will. Is there a godly discontentment to seek more? Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, obviously, if if we're discontent in in our walk with Christ, I think the Spirit of God does... Uh, uh, move us in that regard when I'm discontent with where I am in the faith. Well, that's a, a godly spirit-fueled discontentment, and that's a good discontentment. Uh, it, it's, it's good when, when Jesus is, is calling us to, to give more of ourselves, no doubt about right. that. The discontentment really we were talking about here is, a, is really a discontentment with my circumstances, my stuff, my possessions, rather than a discontent with where I am spiritually. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I think each of us, uh, at times we look inward at our lives and go, I'm not the Christian that I should be. Uh, I was out on a mission trip uh, pat- this past summer with a, an ex-missionary, and he said, man, I feel alive in, in country here where I'm at. And he goes, really, I'm a bad Christian at home. I don't do anything. And what it was, God was stirring up in him this godly, spirit-induced discontentment to, well, live a life of obedience is what he was doing. Right. So if you're struggling with discontentment and, and we'll, we'll, we'll limit it to maybe material possessions or something, mm-hmm. uh, can you force contentment? Like what, what can bring you from that place of discontentment to being content with what yeah. you have? Well, discontentment with stuff, discontentment with our circumstances, it, it's always fueled by inward look. It's always fueled by the woe is me that if, uh, if I could just have this, I'd be happy. And so uh, you can't force it. So what, what would happen is if I'm discontent with whatever it may be, uh, well, then I need to take my focus off of my circumstances and I need to look uh, to Christ. Here, here's what happens. So oftentimes we are so focused on all the things we don't have, we never look at what we do have. And then if we just take our eyes off of that and look to the graces that God has given us, all of a sudden we realize all these things we were worried about and we were, you know, maybe not happy with, well, they kind of fade into the background. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can past acts of ungodliness ruin today's contentment? It can in the fact that we have a propensity of humans is to carry our shame and carry our guilt. The good news of the gospel, the gospel is new days and new starts at every moment. Uh, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so let's say we've done something uh, in our past that was, and we know is downright sinful, and we're we're carrying maybe some of the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, uh, there could definitely be some godly sorrow knowing that I had done something in my past that caused this heartache, and maybe it's still causing me some real ramifications today. There's some real consequences that I'm dealing with because of my action. Uh, I, that would be more of a, of a spiritual discontentment that uh, I want to strive to be better. But on, on the flip side of that, make sure we always understand, let's don't carry our, our guilt and our shame. Christ has taken that on the cross. Here's what I want you to hear. When Jesus died on the cross, when he died on the cross, he took your sins and he placed them on Christ. Christ took the wrath that you deserve because of your sins on his shoulders, and then he took his righteousness and he put it on your shoulders. And so today, if you're in Christ, regardless of what you've done in the past, as Jesus looks down upon you, as the Father looks down upon you, he no longer sees uh, Chris Williams the sinner, but he looks down upon me and he sees the perfect, unblemished obedience of his son. He looks at me and he sees, well, that I obeyed in all the ways his son obeyed. He no longer sees my sins. And we got to remind ourselves of the gospel every day. 
We've got to remind ourselves we don't carry our guilt with us. Christ has taken that. We like to pick it back up and carry it, though, don't we? But there's no need to. That's the power of the gospel. Amen. Last comment. Thank you for the very timely message, Pastor Chris. It's much appreciated. Um, and that was our last question. And I want to ask if you would close us in prayer. You bet. And then I've got just uh, one or two things to mention. Yeah, let me pray. Father, we love you this morning, and we are simply thankful for the gospel, that the gospel does save, that the gospel does give new life and make new creations. And I pray, Father, for any person in this room who, who has sinned as every one of us has. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of your glory. That, oh God, that we could hide ourselves in the righteousness of Christ. That you would help us by your spirit to set that, that shame, that guilt aside and rest in your sovereign care, in your goodness, and in your grace, and in your mercy. Oh God, would you help each of us to, uh, well, to simply uh, begin to live the life that you originally created us and you redeemed us to live, one that is in right relationship with you, with our focus squarely upon you in obedience to your words. Give us the strength to deny self, to obey the scriptures and follow your example. Give us this godly contentment in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God.